When you're weary, feeling small, when tears are in your eyes, I will dry them all. I'll take your part. Oh, when times get rough. And friends just can't be found Like a bridge over troubled water I will lay me down Like a bridge over troubled water I will lay me I want to ask you what might seem like a strange question before I begin my words, before Iskor. How many of you have, saying, have been saying Iskor for more than five years? More than 10? More than 20? More than 30, more than 40. Who's saying Iskor for the first time? Many of us have been saying this prayer for more than half of our lives. Have you ever wondered why you keep saying these words so many years after your loved ones passing? And why are we saying them in community? I'll come back to this later. I have a notebook that I'm very fond of. It accompanied me to the pandemic. I receive it empty and began to fill it with reflections, phrases, or ideas that seemed valuable to me. Some are taken from books, others from a movie I watched or a class I participated in. I even wrote down some dreams that I did not want to forget. And next to each sentence or paragraph, I added some notes or initials. SH means it could be used for some Shabbat sermon. C for a class. RH, Rosh Hashanah sermon. KN, Kol Nidre. So going through the pages of the notebook 15 days ago, I found two lines that I had written the letters YZ next to. These were ideas I set aside to be part of a East Coast sermon today. The first is a sentence taken from an article in the Miami Herald on June 7, 2022. What did it say? How much is a life worth? That sentence was part of a story that analyzed how a Florida court was planning to decide on the dollar value of each human life lost in the Surfside building that collapsed for the purpose of compensating victims' loved ones. The lawyer says that each of these deaths are all equally tragic, but the court will not consider the financial value of each of their lives equally. There are many variables the court will consider. For example, who are the survivors of the victim's family? Are they little children who don't have parents? Are they adults who are essentially self-sufficient? The article goes on and clarifies that they will also make distinction based on income potential.
For example, if you were a nanny, your heirs will not be paid, the same as the heirs of a banker. How much is a life worth? The article continues with the reaction of a victim's family member who says, the idea that there will be a group of people sitting there trying to put a dollar value on my mother, my grandmother, is insulting to me. How much is a life worth? How can you compare the pain and suffering of two different people? Is loss more difficult for a spouse who lived with their partner for 30 years or for a newlywed whose wife was taken from him after only a few months? This article makes several references to Kenneth Feinberg, the special master of the US government September 11 victim compensation fund. I bought his book called What is Life Worth? Should a family of a firefighter who died saving the life of dozens of people receive more than that of a secretary, a chef, or a lawyer who was in one of the buildings? Should age be a determining factor? Asked the author. What about the 60 plus widows who were pregnant with children who would never know their father? Are their lives worth more? Less? You listen. You let them vent, says the author. I learned some valuable lessons about what not to say. I tell you that on September 11, I made a terrible blunder during a hearing of telling a father who lost a daughter, I know how you feel. And he looked at me and said, Mr. Feinberg, you're trying to be your best, but don't you ever tell me you know how I feel. You have no idea how I feel about losing my daughter. That is the single most difficult aspect of what I do, he says. It's not the calculation. It's not the cutting the checks. The most difficult part of all of this assignment is sitting in a room with the victim's family, inviting them to vent about life's unfairness. How much are the people you remember today worth? Iskor says their worth is unmeasurable. Today here, every life is a whole world, your world. We come together to remember some who experienced tragic deaths long before the time. Others who lived very long lives. We remember relationship with the deepest ties and other relationship more distant. We come to remember them because they have shaped us into who we are. This statement brings me to the second note in my notebook with the letters U, Y, Z next to it. It says, watch the last episode of Stitzel again. So I put it on and I say what is called. Where does anyone suddenly go? Where does everyone suddenly go? For those who haven't seen the show, 10 seconds summary. Stitzel is the story of a Haredi family in the Geula section of Jerusalem. The show is not only a reflection of the condition of ultra-Orthodox people in Jerusalem, but a meditation on the meaning of love, loss, family, community. In the final episode, the family patriarch, Shulem, is sitting with his brother, Nuhem, and his son, the artist, Akiva. The three characters I mentioned are living together in the rabbi's apartment in Jerusalem. And they get into a major argument. At the end of the episode, the rabbi's son and brother decide they have had enough of him and inform him that they're moving out. Since his wife was dead and his children moved out, the rabbi will now be left to live alone for the first time in his life. As his son and brother are about to walk out the door, the rabbi turns to them and says, don't live like this. Come, sit with me, take a glass of soda. While sitting at the table, the rabbi recalls a line from a book by an author he identifies as Bashevis, who I assume is Itzhak Bashevis Singer, the Nobel Prize of Literature. And this is the line, the dead don't go anywhere. 
They are all here. Each man is a cemetery, an actual cemetery. And there lie all our grandfathers and grandmothers, the father, the mother, the wife, the child, the sibling, the friend. Everyone is here all the time. As the episode and the series come to an end, the camera moves back slowly and the table lengthens and previous generation of family members appear around what was likely a Shabbat table, turning what the rabbi had said into a vision. The three men, a father, a brother, and a son, are sitting now together, joined by the generation of people who preceded them. It struck me as I thought about the line, every person is a cemetery. That from a scientific point of view, that statement is true. The genes of all those who came before us are buried within us. Today we can even trace them with DNA testing. The genes of past generations are buried within us and are discernible and even traceable. And yet, buried doesn't seem like quite the right image. Rabbi Roy Walter analyzing the episode because he says that those folk, those genes are not buried within us, they are alive within us. They are in fact what they fan us, what shape us, what make us who and what we are. And in no small way, who they were and what they were and how they lived and also are also alive within us. It's not just their genes that make us who we are, isn't also their values and the character that are so very much alive within us, shaping us, defining us. Their love is palpable, but they are gone. Their memories visit us, but they are no longer here. But is that not what Iskor celebrates? Our tradition encourages us to remember the people who help shape us. Some of us are so busy living our lives, which we should do that we don't think about them actively all the time. Some of us think a lot about those we lost, but regardless, on major Jewish holidays, so rich with family and togetherness, Judaism set aside time for us, not just to actively remember, but to celebrate them. In one sense, yes, they are buried within us, like the line from Shtisl implies, but because they are also really alive within us, Judaism demands that we are grateful for their lives. Iskor creates the opportunity to remember not just that they meant something to us, but they continue to mean something to us. As a rabbi, I see how true this is, not just in Iskor. I see it during weddings, funerals, baby namings, and unveiling. I see it embodying the grandpa's talis as a new child comes into his Brit Milao naming or wrapped around the bride and groom during their wedding, as part of the chupa's roof. I hear it in the tributes given by sons and daughters at the parents' funeral. I have seen it at Shabbat tables when great grandkids hold the kiddush cup that the grandmother brought from Ukraine or from Syria, or the cedar plate that has held the same role every year for three generations. And I've seen boys putting on the tefillim with old straps that creak with noise because those same straps have been around for four generations. Those are not just objects. They are all symbols of our life, our loved ones are within us. Even though their original owners are gone, even though their objects may have belonged to people we have never met because they died before we were born, truthfully, truthfully, they are alive within us every day in the phrases we repeat to our children. In the words of our parents say to us, in the gesture that imitate them, even though we may not be aware we are making them. In the way we talk, smile, move, walk, all of this, all of this and more than we can account for are signs that people we remember are alive within us. All the generations that come before us come alive in us every day as we live in our life. So today, we will shed tears in remembrance of them. Hopefully, we will also celebrate them we're thankful for them, grateful because we still possess those strong memories of them. And once again, we will confirm that our love for them remains alive within us. 
each of us is a repository of generations before us. Our genes, our behaviors, our strength, and even our weakness, our values. We are the sum total of all who came before us. And what greater honor can we give them than being thankful for all we received and living our life as a reflection of their legacy? Let me tell you a secret. You don't actually have to come to Shul to say Isco. For Kaddish, you need a minion, but not for Isco. We don't tell people that because it's not good for our business. <laughs> but in theory, it can be said alone at home. But we don't do that because we are not just mourners. We are a community of mourners that understand that the value of the life of our loved ones, their worth is measured by the deeds they perform with the time they were given, the love they share, the people they help, the mistake they made, the husbands, wife, children, brothers, sisters, parents, partners, friends they left behind, the communities they enriched, the tradition they passed down, the beauty they paused to acknowledge and the growth and learning they experienced each day that they were blessed to be alive. The East Coast service during Yom Kippur is a time of remembering, of thinking about the loved ones who are not here with us. We are here today to recall the yesterdays we share with loved ones and to lament the tomorrows we will experience without them. During Iskor, this moment dedicated to the precious memory of the time shared with our loved ones, we reconnect to our tradition. We affirm that we remember them. They're still a part of our lives for they will always accompany us on our life journey, wherever we may go. Where does everyone suddenly go? They are within us. And what are they worth? Everything. Please rise for Iskor.